parody songsters are having a weird moment in the cultural zeitgeist, aren't they? At least they were when I scripted this video. Hi, I'm Abby. This is One Minute Off, and some someone wants a little bit more attention, huh? All right, baby. All right, come on. Come on. I haven't worn this shirt in a really long time. It's my dad's old shirt. A lot of my shirts are my dad's old shirt. Anyone who knows me knows I'm a huge oldies fan. I actually got way, way too excited about Billy Joel releasing music for the first time back in February. I, it, it made me tear up a little bit. I'm not ashamed. But I'm not just like into Billy Joel or what some might dub, you know, yacht rock. I kind of go all over the older music spectrum. I grew up listening to like early 50s and 60s songs because that's what my dad listened to when he was growing up. And he just made me listen to those same songs in the car uh, back when, you know, CDs were the the last form of media. My dad's love of classic rock and its predecessors was definitely passed down to me. And for me, that era always seemed to like capture this essence of like societal, political, and personal introspection in a way that not a lot of genres have done since then. You know, lyrics would often transcend between like love and heartbreak and go into like deeper issues like civil rights and war and protests and uh, racism and sexism and all that. The music became a reflection of its times, giving, you know, a voice to the hopes, fears, and rebellions of an entire generation. Rich tapestry of themes and authentic raw expression found in artists like uh, the Beatles, uh, Bob Dylan, Janis Joplin, the list pretty much goes on and on. It was like that counterculture point where music was not just entertainment, but sort of was becoming this powerful medium for uh, change and reflection. So that was my musical background growing up, but when I was a when I was an angsty teen, much like a lot of the other angsty teens around me, I discovered, among other musical endeavors, uh, Bo Burnham. This teenager who was making satirical songs about his angsty little world and ended up becoming this hit musical comedy sensation on YouTube. This was, you know, before I discovered My Chemical Romance and Panic at the Disco and Fall Out Boy and really steered away from classic rock for a while. <laughs> Toto. <laughs> it's ruining my shot. When I was in high school, I discovered Bo Burnham as this funny original kid who wrote these raps and rhymes to very simple chord progressions just in his bedroom. It was kind of the best thing in the world. And if we met in 1780, I was a white southern aristocratic plantation owner and you were my dark skinned servant lady. Slave. Whenever I could get away from the missus, I'd go to your shed and then I'd steal you kisses. But let's be serious, I'd still work you full time as a slave. There's a difference between romantic language and a complete disregard for socioeconomic trends. This was also well before Bo Burnham became an even bigger sensation during the pandemic with his Netflix special Inside and became a musical comedy icon for an entirely new generation of people. He was like this breath of fresh air in a way. Bo Burnham's always been this person who is only a few years older than I am, making me reflect on my own life and the absurdity of growing up in the internet age, which is obviously, you know, a topic that classic rock musicians, uh, can't really talk about. Don't worry, I'm getting to my point. Stick with me. When Inside came out, and honestly, with a lot of specials before that, Bo proved his ability to stay ahead of the curve when it came to satirical musical comedy, even at a super young age. He got into Harvard, Brown, and even NYU's theater school, but he deferred from all of them to go on tour with his comedy and just never went back. He then went on to bend that curve even further with the considerable comedic vulnerability shown in Inside. And for some reason, you know, whenever I listened to him, I thought, my my parents wouldn't be into this, right? Flight of the Concords was a thing, you know, Weird Al Yankovic was a thing, Garfunkel and Oates even, but this kind of like parody song stuff, they wouldn't really, you know, have any experience with that, right? I think I was wrong. We'll send them all we've got, John Wayne and Randolph Scott. Remember those exciting fighting scenes? To the shores of Tripoli, but not to Mississippi. What do we do? We send the Marines. For might makes right, until they've seen the light. They've got to be protected, all their rights respected, till somebody we like can be elected. Members of the Corps all hate the thought of war. They'd rather kill them off by peaceful means. Before there was Bo Burnham or Adam Sandler or Steve Martin, there was Tom Lehrer. What you just heard was an excerpt from the song called Send the Marines. Growing up in New York, Tom Lehrer became interested in popular music from a young age and began playing piano and writing show tunes as a kid. He was considered a child prodigy and began attending Harvard at the age of 15 to study mathematics. As he studied, he started to write comedic songs about his experiences at Harvard, including this one from 1945. Fight fiercely, Harvard! Fight, fight, fight! Impress them with our prowess! Do! Oh, fellows, do not let the crimson down. Be of stout heart and true. 
Come on, chaps, fight for Harvard's glorious name. Won't it be peachy if we win the game? Oh, goody, let's try not to injure them. But fight, fight, fight. Let's not be rough, though. Fight, 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 and do. He staged a show in 1951 called The Physical Review, which was a, uh, a play on the leading scientific journal, uh, The Physical Review, which was a musical drama that consisted of 21 songs he had written during his time at Harvard. After graduating, he went on to teach math and other classes at MIT, Harvard, Wellesley, and the University of California at Santa Cruz. He'd also go on to sell you know, hundreds of thousands of records and was making quite a name for himself in popular media, especially what was becoming to be known as the New Left. Then in 1955, despite his musical popularity, master's degree, and overall privileged status in an era where most American adults did not have a high school diploma, Tom Lehrer was drafted into the army. It occurred to me that if any songs are going to come out of World War III, we better start writing them now. As you know, World War III will be the first world war to be seen on television. <laughs> and, uh... <laughs> so long, Mom. I'm off to drop the bomb. So don't wait up. A pile of debris. Remember, mommy, I'm off to get a commie. So send me a salami and try to smile somehow. I'll look for you when the war is over. An hour and a half from now. During his time there, he actually claimed to have invented the jello shot as a means of getting around alcohol restrictions on base. He revealed in 2020 that he was actually working for the NSA, which was still a federal secret until Congress revealed its existence in 1975. This would inspire songs such as It Makes a Fellow Proud to Be a Soldier. The heart of every man in our platoon must swell with pride for the nation's youth, the cream of which is marching at his side for the fascinating rules and regulations that we share and the quaint and curious costumes that we're called upon to wear. Tom Lehrer's unique lyricism and biting satirical comedy would pretty much rocket him to stardom. He actually quit teaching at Harvard for a bit to just tour all over the world. Then in 1960, he just quit performing altogether, uh, just to go back to teaching college kids. Sir Cameron McIntosh, the legendary Broadway producer, would say that of all famous songwriters, Tom is probably the only one that, in the great sense of that word, is an amateur and that he never wanted to be a professional. And that is the quote that made me think about Bo Burnham. Both of these artists are similar in the way that they have one foot in the mainstream and one foot out. Tom Lehrer only recorded a total of 37 songs and did 107 shows during his entire career. Yet he remains one of the most important musical, political satirists of the 20th century. Bo Burnham began as a YouTube sensation, performed on stage for a bit, then disappeared from popular culture for a few years before releasing Inside, and now still remains relatively low profile. Their lack of public appearance is not their only similarity. Both of these artists, you know, somber tones in some of their songs don't really come from a, you know, challenging upbringing. Tom Lehrer was born on the Upper East Side of Manhattan as the heir to a trailblazing necktie company, and Bo Burnham was born in Hamilton, Massachusetts as the son of a successful construction company owner. Both Burnham and Lehrer's backgrounds, inherently linked with the privileges of you know, education, race, and economic status, have afforded them this unique platform from which to dissect and comment on a range of political issues. However, Bo Burnham's work is more tailored to a generation that has grown up with the internet as a backdrop to their lives. Our lives. His critiques are not just of political systems, but also of the ways in which internet culture mediates our understanding of those systems. By weaving his political commentary into much broader narratives about the human condition in the age of the internet, Burnham invites his audience to question not just the world around them, but their role within it. Despite the decades between them, these two satirical musicians and their similarities, I think, are culturally important for a few reasons. Hooray for new math, new math. It won't do you a bit of good to review math. It's so simple, so very simple, uh, that only a child can do it. Split a decision with long division. Take the circumference of your circumcision. Live like your data, and when you're all set, put it all together and whatever you get. It's new math. It's new math. First off, it underscores the responsibility of artists uh, with societal influence to address and critique political and social issues. Both Lara and Burnham have used their platform to draw attention to injustices and absurdities on the spectrum of relatively hilarious to incredibly serious, demonstrating how you know privilege can be leveraged for social commentary. Secondly, I think their respective work exemplifies the 
evolving nature of satire as a form of political critique. Lehrer and Burnham both adapted their satirical methods to the context of their own times, reflecting the, you know, changing landscape of political discourse and the role of the musical satirist within it. Their ability to engage with these issues from their positions of privilege highlights the enduring power of satire uh, to bridge gaps in understanding and to foster critical dialogue. There is one question that wouldn't really leave my brain when I was doing research for this video, and that is this. Does this sort of political satire work. In a way, Tom Lehrer actually believed his own work to be overall ineffective. He argued that satire inherently relies on making exaggerated comparisons, which easily allow critics to dismiss it by saying, oh, you know, that's that's an exaggeration. It wasn't really like that. Come on. That's like, come on. Don't be dramatic. For instance, the song I played earlier, Send the Marines, which critiques the tendency of the USA to, you know, send Marines to parts of the world they're trying to make peace with, likely didn't actually change anyone's views on the US military. Individuals with, you know, loyalty toward the military might even find humor in it, while others would argue that it's overly simplistic and unfair to suggest that all Marines are for is offing people they don't like. The inherent silliness of the song didn't actually cause anyone to change their behavior. And one could make the very same argument, I think, with Bo Burnham's work. Tom Lehrer himself quit his musical career mainly because he saw the new left and the hippie counterculture of the 60s growing in popularity, and he didn't exactly agree with the way anyone involved in that scene was approaching the issues at hand. In the digital age, a liberal approach to politics mostly resides on late night satire shows and SNL. These shows have generally agreed to produce agreeable background noise to an audience that already shares its views. So do Lara and Burnham's, but the difference here is well summed up in a quote by Arash Z. Vatan in The Harvard Crimson. The difference is that Lara and Burnham found comedy in poking bears, while the shows simply laugh at carcasses. In 1982, 22 years after his retirement from music, Lara was quoted as saying this, Things I once thought were funny are scary now. I often feel like a resident of Pompeii who has been asked for some humorous comments on lava. If you've seen interviews with Bo Burnham recently, he kind of says pretty much the same thing. <laughs> Whether through the lens of academia or the internet age, the legacy of satirists like Lara and Burnham underscores the importance of using one's platform, however it is derived, to engage with and critique the current political landscape. Humor might not end arguments, but it does open the door to discussions that might not take place otherwise. Thus, when these comedians' comedy was actually impactful, it was because it expanded the boundaries of what was acceptable to question. If we can sum up any kind of conclusion here, maybe it's this. While satire might not directly dismantle institutions, it can certainly start more conversations about that topic. Thanks for watching this little comparison video. I'm gonna attach some more reading below about Tom Lehrer if you're interested, and um, I'll also probably attach like a Spotify playlist or something. All of his music is in the public domain, which is pretty sick. I love doing these little music comparison videos. I uh, go, uh, again, I listen to all sorts of different stuff, so if you have any suggestions or anything like that, feel free to leave it below. Have you heard of Tom Lehrer before? Have you heard of Bo Burnham before? Everyone's heard of Bo Burnham. This is the internet, everyone's heard of Bo Burnham. <laughs> Who are some of your favorite satire artists? Do you believe that, you know, political satire is a legitimate avenue for social change? Let me know. I'm Abby, this is One Minute Off, and I will see you next time. Bye.